and it turned into plasma, accelerated and ejected out into the chamber, and that's uh, what produces the rocket thrust. This engine is great news for space travelers, but there's a drawback. The magnets are currently made of copper, far too heavy for flight. The solution is lightweight, superconducting magnets, but they only function when they're cold. Jacob Chancery showed me how these curious black disks work. Right now, this is not working as a superconductor because it's at room temperature. You can see that it doesn't repel magnetic fields. Jacob's magnet only starts working at minus 300 Fahrenheit, the same temperature as this stuff, liquid nitrogen. Let's see if it'll work now. There we go. There we go. If I blow across the top of this cube with a straw, you can see that little cube will start spinning so fast, you can't even tell it's a cube anymore. That is very cool. In the same way they levitate the cube, a coil of these magnets inside the engine will work like an invisible nozzle, controlling the flow of plasma without ever touching it. And you have to keep your magnets within this motor at these temperatures. That's right. Well, at the same time, you have to keep the plasma at incredibly high temperatures. That's correct. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of very high-tech insulation to be done between those two elements. Yeah. Jacob has his work cut out because Vasimir is going to be in space sooner than expected. Whilst I was playing with magnets, Franklin received a contract from NASA to test his engine aboard the International Space Station. I really like today and the engine that we've seen today is absolutely amazing because at the moment it's using existing technologies. It's a, a combination of, of plasma physics, electromagnetism and, and RF physics um, all combined to make this amazing engine. What I really like about it is that it's another step towards, you know, the, the warp drive of science fiction. Absolutely astounding. The space plane and mothership align for docking. But the walkway is jammed. The crew get changed. They're going to have to do this the hard way. Vasimir engines fire. As the Earth shrinks behind them, the crew raise a drink to their new life and the adventures that lie ahead. This mission is headed out towards the giant gas planet Jupiter. I have to choose one of its moons to set up a human colony. I've got my shortlist down to three. The ice worlds of Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. Amazingly, I managed to find somebody else who was faced with a very similar problem. Uh, I would worry that would impact this, so the other option could be you could have just the cable floating with it. Pat Troutman is head of NASA's Advanced Concepts Lab. A group who use Hollywood-style CGI to dream up future space missions. He was asked to find the perfect moon for a base to explore Jupiter from. There's such a large distance between Earth and the Moon, from Moon to Mars, and then another quantum increase from Mars to Jupiter, that you need an outpost in the Jovian system just to explore the whole system. And that outpost is a place you can go back, it has safe haven, uh, it has uh, supplies, uh, and a basic infrastructure so that you can uh, recoup from your battles with the wilds. This outpost needed to be constructed somewhere close enough to study Jupiter in great detail and have enough resources to fuel further missions to the outer solar system. We can't go to Jupiter itself because the gravity would just crush and there's no real surface on it. Uh, when you start looking at the moons, uh, of course Europa is very interesting. Uh, it has oceans, uh, we think, on, under there, but uh, the radiation environment is so severe because it's so close to Jupiter uh, that we really couldn't fathom going there. Jupiter has a massive magnetic field that traps passing radiation forming an invisible but deadly belt that extends into space. Europa is in the thick of this band. 
a human landing there would be dead within a day. So that's another moon off the list, leaving just two. So we started backing out and looking at the other moons, the major ice moons, Ganymede and Callisto, uh, and both were good candidates for going there. Ganymede, the next moon out, suffers less radiation. But there's one moon that escapes Jupiter's band altogether, Callisto. So it was a, a sweet spot, so to speak. And uh, again, being covered with uh, ice, uh, it's just the, the best material we could possibly have. Callisto's just a fantastic place to go. It may not be as smooth or as large as Ganymede, but Callisto is my choice. It's big enough to make a home there. It's got plenty of water ice, and it's outside Jupiter's deadly radiation belt. But what would it be like to live there? Well, for a start, it's much smaller than the Earth, about a third the size. That means it has less gravity, too. Coping with this will be one of the biggest challenges the pioneers will face. So I decided to experience it for myself in the most amazing laboratory I've ever been to. Whoa. Thanks. Certainly. Wow. This is our reduced gravity laboratory. Uh, it just happens to be inside an aircraft. That just looks like a commercial plane. Well, it is very similar. It's actually a military version of a DC-9. It's a C-9, and it's been refurbished by NASA to perform the reduced gravity mission. We'll pitch up at anywhere from 45 to 52 degrees nose high, go over the top after about 8,000 feet, pitch back over, and free fall back down. And we'll go right into the next one, maintaining that energy. And by varying that parabolic flight profile, we can actually vary the G field that you will feel inside the aircraft. So just by tuning the pitch and the throttle, you can simulate the moon's conditions, you can simulate the Mars conditions, any kind of gravity you want. Whatever your research requires, we can adjust our flight profile and provide that for you. The smooth curve of the flight path is called a parabola. It's the same curve that roller coaster tracks make, and it ensures that the level of reduced gravity is the same on the way up as it is on the way down. Test director Dom Del Rosso has scheduled a few parabolas at Callisto Gravity for me today. It's a real honor, as it's very rare for visitors to be allowed inside this incredible flying laboratory. So there's one last thing we need to do to make sure you're fully kitted out here, is we need to make sure that wow. you're properly identified My for the flight name today. Badge. Outstanding, well, welcome aboard. Thank It'll you be very an outstanding much. Flight. Before the flight, I had to go through a briefing. Uh, obviously, you, you may not feel well, you just might feel strange. Um, if you do need to go back to the bathroom for any reason, please let one of us know that you're going back there uh, because we don't want to be flying parabolas while you're in the bathroom unannounced. And take a little something to help the nausea that I was assured would be coming my way. What I was letting myself in for was a stomach churning 60 parabolas in total, over three hours flight, but only a couple of minutes at Callisto gravity. So excited about it, it should be amazing. The rest of the time was for these guys, a huge team of engineers and astronauts testing out prototype suits for the 2020 moon mission. Once we were safely out over the Gulf of Mexico, it was time